Jobless claims weigh down your news update, and Ari and I make no bones about it on this edition of State of the Bands Weekend, starting right now. Hello and welcome to Arbitrage State of the Bands Weekend for October 23rd, 2021. I'm Joshua Stark. The number of Americans applying for unemployment benefits fell last week to a new low point since the pandemic erupted. Evidence that layoffs are declining as companies hold on to workers. Unemployment claims dropped 6,000 to 290,000 last week, the third straight drop, the Labor Department said Thursday. That's the fewest people to apply for benefits since March 14, 2020, where the pandemic intensified. Applications for jobless aid, which generally track the pace of layoffs, have fallen steadily from about 900,000 in January. Unemployment claims are increasingly returning to normal, but many other aspects of the job market haven't done so. Sales of previously occupied U.S. homes bounced back in September to their strongest pace since January as mortgage rates tick higher, motivating buyers to get off the sidelines. The National Association of Realtors said Thursday that its existing home sales rose 7% compared with August to a seasonally adjusted annual rate of 6.29 million units. That's stronger than the 6.11 million units that economists had been expecting, according to FactSet. Sales were down 2.3% compared with September last year, a time when home purchases surged as buyers who had held off during the early months of the pandemic returned in force. The increase in sales this last month has attributed to mortgage rates, said Lawrence Yoon, the NIR's chief economist. The autumn season looks to be one of the best autumn home sales seasons in 15 years. Kim Kardashian is studying to be a lawyer, but who knew she was so good at cracking cases, too? In a wild turn of events, a photo of the Keeping Up with the Kardashian star 40 rocking a gold dress at the 2018 Met Gala has led to something quite unexpected, solving a mystery. A viral snap that showed her posing next to the coffin of Nejemok has led to the conclusion of a long-running criminal case involving the golden artifact. In a recent episode of journalists Ben Lewis podcasts Art Bust Scandalous Stories of the Art World, he dives into how the photo played a role in catching the thieves who stole the coffin and sold it to the Metropolitan Museum of Art for $4 million using fake documents. Before that, the coffin, which dates back to the 1st century BC, was dug up at the Almenya region of Europe in 2011 during that year's revolution. Surgeons in New York have successfully attached a kidney grown in a genetically altered pig to a human patient and found that the organ worked normally, a scientific breakthrough that one day may yield a vast new supply of organs for severely ill patients. Researchers have long sought to grow organs in pigs that are suitable for transplanting into humans. Technologies like cloning and genetic engineering have brought that vision closer to reality in recent years, but testing these experimental organs in humans has presented dawning ethical questions. So surgeons at NYU Langan Health took an astonishing step. With the family's consent, they attached the pig's kidney to a brain-dead patient who was sustained on a ventilator and then followed the body's response while taking measures of the kidney's function. It is the first operation of its kind. The researchers tracked the results for just 54 hours, and many questions remain to be answered about the long-term consequences of such an operation. More after this. It's Thursday night, and you're grabbing drinks with some friends. Started off with a pitcher for the table, which quickly becomes two. There's pool. And there's the photo booth. All right, everybody squeeze in. Say cheese. Followed naturally by an order of wings. And another. Can we get some extra ranch sauce? Then there's the ceremonial nightcap. So what are we doing this weekend? And lastly, it's back to the car, which, if you're buzzed... ...could be the most expensive night of your life. Getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving, because buzz driving is drunk driving. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. 
This week's State of the Bands blog includes profiles in arbitrage and spooky, scary skeleton. They're selling them online. Yeah. All this and more in this week's State of the Bands blog, available now at arbitragetrade.com. Now, let's go to the Chief Analytics Officer of Arbitrage Trade Analytics, Ari Walter, for more. Ari's also one of our rock star writers that helps us out here at SOTB. Ari, great to have you on the show. I appreciate being invited. Thanks for that awesome intro. You know, it's part of the job, ma'am. Anyway, it's good to have you on the show. If you've noticed a spooky slant to some of our articles this month, it is all Ari. Every single bit of it is Ari, and we're a little scared. But we're talking about selling skeletons this week, right? Yes, we are. In the spirit of Halloween, I figured why not just keep it spooky? Fun fact, did you know you can actually sell human remains online? There is no federal regulation for that. There are a handful of states, and I believe it was two or three when I looked, who do, they have rules about it. They don't necessarily let you sell certain things, but most other states, it's just, you can do whatever you want, essentially. You know, it's an interesting thing because TikTok these days, we had an article about TikTok making me buy it. You know, the the hashtag TikTok made me buy it has become really popular and apparently leggings are a thing. I don't know. Now you can get bones on here. This guy whose account name is John's Bones is selling skulls and stuff on TikTok. Tell me more. Sure. So... (laughs) <laughs> it's funny because um, TikTok definitely is the root of all stress and just treat yourself buys online. And yes, so John Ferry is somebody who has a quote educational TikToks, and I and I mean it in terms of he's not like a medical doctor. He is an osteologist, allegedly. I don't know what those qualifications exactly are. However. Um, After looking at several of his videos, it's pretty clear that he's not one of these guys that just goes, I'm going to buy these bones and decorate my house with them. No, he's actually like showing you that, hey, this is how these bones come together. This is what they're for. These are the different functions that they have. This is how you could potentially solve a crime if you see these bones. And in fact, he will respond to commenters when they ask him a question. And so if somebody goes, hey, man, I found bones in my wall and I'm scared. What is this? He'll say, well, you know, that's not or, or is. But so far it has been that's not a human vertebra. That's actually a dog or a squirrel or a cat or whatever. And we'll show this is what human vertebra look like. Well, there are some questions about this, though. There are only a few states that he can't ship to, but as far as federally, are there any regulations or anything like that to this? Not really, which is crazy. But when you think about it, it makes complete sense because, you know, you could technically sell your kidney. You could ship the kidney. It's just a biological hazard sort of thing. It it has to be shipped a certain way. But yeah, there's, there's really no federal rules against shipping human remains at all. This is fascinating. And if you look this up on arbitragetrade.com, we actually have on there some stock picks. Two of our stock picks are funeral homes, but one of our stock picks is Thermo Fisher Scientific. Now, Thermo Fisher Scientific does this as a business. They sell remains. For example, if you call them up, you say, I want a rat skull. They say, here's a rat skull. If you need vertebra, here's a vertebra. If you need a skull, they'll get you a skull. Legal, as far as it's concerned, looks like it is. Ari, we're going to have more with you coming up in the blog and, and especially on the show as well. So anybody wants to read more of Ari, it's on arbitragetrade.com slash blog. And we'll be back right after this on Arbitrage State of the Bands weekend. Stick around. See on page four that the projections need to be tornado. Next Thursday? Seriously? Thursday? Can't do that. Uh Uh-uh. This is really inconvenient. I have yoga that day. I have no time for this. So? I can't do Thursday, but I can do Friday. Disasters don't plan ahead. You can. Talk to your loved ones about how you're going to be ready in an emergency. Don't wait. Communicate. Earlier this year, an insistent cry rose from business leaders and Republican governors 
cut off a $300 a week federal supplement for the unemployed Americans. Many people, they argued, would come off the sidelines and take the millions of jobs that employers were desperate to fill. Yet three months after half the states began ending their federal payment, there has been no significant influx of job seekers. In states that cut off the $300 check, the workforce, the number of people who either have a job or are work looking for one, has risen no more than it has in the states that maintain the payment. That federal aid, along with two jobless aid programs that serve gig workers and the long-term unemployed, ended nationally September 6th. Yet, America's overall workforce actually shrank that month. Policymakers were pinning too many hopes on ending unemployment insurance as a labor market boost, said Fiona Craig, managing director of the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute, which used J.P. Morgan-based account data to study the issue. The work disincentive effects were clearly small. Labor shortages have persisted longer than many economists expected, deepening a mystery at the heart of the job market. Companies are eager to add workers and have posted a near record number of available jobs. Unemployment remains elevated. The economy still has 5 million fewer jobs than it did before the pandemic. Yet job growth slowed in August and September. An analysis of state-by-state data by the Associated Press said that the workforces in 25 states that maintained the $300 payment actually grew slightly more than May through September, according to data released Friday, than they did in the 25 states that cut off the payment early, most of them in June. The $300 a week federal check on top of regular state jobless aid meant that many of the unemployed received more in benefits than they earned at their old jobs. An earlier study by Arendrajit Dube, an economist at University of Massachusetts, Amherst, and several colleagues found that states that cut off the $300 federal payment saw a small increase in the number of unemployed taking jobs, but it also found that it didn't draw more people off the sidelines to look for work. Economists point to a range of factors that are likely keeping millions of former recipients of federal jobless aid from returning to the workforce. Many Americans in public-facing jobs still fear contracting COVID-19, for example. Some families lack child care. Indeed, the pandemic seems to have caused a real reevaluation of priorities, with some people deciding to spend more time with family and others insistent on working remotely or gaining more flexible hours. Nationally, the proportion of women who were either working or looking for work in September fell for a second straight month, evidence that many parents, mostly mothers, are still unable to manage their child care duties to return to work. Staffing at child care centers has fallen, reducing the care that is available, and while schools have reopened for in-person learning, frequent closings because of COVID outbreaks have been disruptive for some working parents. Exacerbating the labor shortfall, a record number of people quit their jobs in in August, in some cases spurred on by the prospect of higher pay elsewhere. More after this on Arbitrage State of the Bands Weekend. Stick around. No word in the English language is less convincing than probably. Are you sure we should get matching tattoos on our first date? Sure. Um, We'll probably stay together. Probably? (laughs) It's been 23 minutes since I ate. I can probably swim. Uh, You should wait 30 minutes. Mm, Okay, now tell me what to do. Cannonball! Cramp! Oh, I have a cramp. I can probably hit the green from here. Probably. Can I get a mulligan? Ready to go? Hey, are you sure you're okay to drive? Yeah, I'm pretty sober. Yeah, I'm probably okay. Probably okay isn't okay, especially when it comes to drinking and driving. If you're drinking, call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. 
Hey, it's Josh, and I'm sitting here with David Grantham. David is one of the guys that is behind the scenes here at Arbitrage, very important to our company, and we want to get to know some of those people today, so that's what we're doing. David, welcome to the show. Glad to have you here. Glad to be here. So who are you? Well, I'm David Grantham. Uh, I am the, in relation to uh, Arbitrage, I'm the Chief Data Officer. Um, I... I'm just a, a 40 year, 41 year old guy uh, from Memphis, Tennessee, originally from Jackson, Mississippi. And I'm an IT guy by trade uh, who's been drug into the financial world by, by Royce and everybody else at Arbitrage. So it's I been think great. that's pretty much it. Yeah. 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 I think, uh, I think we got some very, very uh, um, similar stories in that respect. Royce has kind of brought us together and we, uh, we have come together to make a cohesive unit. So absolutely. Yeah. So what's your background professionally? So I've been in the IT space for over 20 years. I've worked on big systems, SAP, Oracle. I've worked for big fortune companies, um, IP, FedEx, more for nonprofits and startups. So uh, my forte is automation and data. And that's what I've been doing for all 20 years. Um, with a heavy hand in mostly database and, and data. And, and so that's kind of how it all flows into arbitrage. I, I deal with all the data needs and, and the automation here. Well, we certainly do appreciate that. Can you go into any, can you go into any uh, depth as to how the automation kind of works here at arbitrage? Well, uh, so Royce was the grandfather of, of that. Uh, so he's, he is a lot more responsible for how it's all begun, but um, we're modernizing how we do our, our data stuff. And it's not that it needs a lot of modernization. It just needs, we just need more always. So the way data, the da way data we get our data feeds today is we get, we buy data from several different sources and we just ingest it monthly and it gets all gets processed through a big old long process. So we, uh, all the, arbitrage indicators and all the algorithms can run against all the stock, the, the tick level data and give our customers what they need for all the alerts and all, all those other things that we, we provide to our customers. That sounds awesome. You know, we, we always work on what we can provide for our customers. This being one thing, you know, and, and we have so much more on arbitragetrade.com. So if you haven't gone there, make sure you go there. Take a look at what we have. Arbitragetrade.org is also our institute side, which we have free lessons. We have free, uh, free seminars and things like that you can take a look at. I definitely encourage you to do that. But let's learn a little bit more about you, David. What do you like to do in your free time? Um, well, I've got three kids, so, you know, Kind of their time is my time at this point. What uh, is free so, time? <laughs> there's none. But, you know, just uh, hanging out with them, kind of feeling out what their interests are. You know, my kids are kind of like me. Uh, they do a lot of computer stuff in the background and they do a lot of gaming. Um, you know, I try to get them outside some. But, uh, yeah, I used to have a life and, you know, and now between arbitrage and kids, it's kind of about it. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you here, David. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this profile segment. We're going to be doing a lot more in the coming months and weeks. And if you have any suggestions for us, let us know at arbitragetrade.com. More after this. Stick around. Help. Ajuda. Bangju. Edem. Help. In the wake of a disaster, there are many people from all backgrounds and all walks of life who need help. Help is available through FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. We're here to provide help to all those who need it. Help. Bonjour. Edem. Bangju. Help. If you or someone you know has been affected by a disaster, call us at 800-621-FEMA. If your home or property has been damaged or destroyed, you've lost your job or income, or face other emergency needs, Please call the Federal Emergency Management Agency at 800-621-FEMA. FEMA. Help is here. A public service message brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. 
Boot up your machines, nerds. It's Winners and Losers Computer Edition. This winner up 25% provides connected and polymer-based 3D printing solutions. It offers 3D printing systems such as polyfet printers, FDM printers, stereolithography printing systems, and programmable photo polymerization printers for rapid prototyping such as design, validation, visualization, and communication. Stratasys Limited, symbol SSYS, starts at $21.92 a share. Next, this winner up 22% provides enterprise and analytics software and services worldwide. It offers MicroStrategy 2021, an enterprise platform, which provides a modern analytics experience by delivering insights across multiple devices to users via hyper-intelligence products, visualization and reporting capabilities, mobility features, and custom applications developed on the platform. Analysts and data scientists with seamless access to trusted governed data directly within their tools and APIs and gateways, multiple deployment options, enterprise semantic graph, scalability, and security. MicroStrategy, symbol MSTR, starts at $615.61 this year. Last this winter, up 19%, provides software as a service, engineering services, hardware for edge computing, the Internet of Things, and remote environment management for the Americas, Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia Pacific, Japan. Landtronics, symbol LTRX, starts at 582 this year. Losers this week, this loser down 26% provides online brokerage services focusing on Chinese investors. The company has developed a brokerage platform which allows investors to trade stocks, options, warrants, and other financial instruments that can be accessed through its app and website. UP Fintech, symbol TIGR, starts at 10.65 a share. Next, this loser down 15% provides tools to create, manage, secure, distribute, and measure live and on-demand video content for enterprises. It offers software on a license, cloud-hosted software as a service, or term software license basis, and sells third-party hardware appliances, as well as provides maintenance and support in professional and other services. QMU, symbol Q-U-M-U, starts at $248 a share. And last but not least, at 14% down, this loser provides intelligent robotics, radio frequency identification, and supply chain solutions for enterprises worldwide. Better Online Solutions, symbol BOSC, starts at $349 a share. Winners and Losers is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute advice and trading. Percentages and stock prices were current at time of recording. Arbitrage Trade Analytics LLC is solely responsible for the content of this podcast, but you should seek out the assistance of a licensed professional for investment advice. Honorary Forest Ranger Betty White here, lending a hand to my dear friend Smokey Bear, because for years he's only said, Only you can prevent wildfires. But there's a lot more to say. Like if you park your car on tall, dry grass, the hot exhaust pipe can start a wildfire. So keep the animals safe, especially the cute shirtless one. Go to SmokeyBear.com to learn more about wildfire prevention. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Wake up and text. Text and eat. Mm -mm. Text and catch the bus. Text and miss your stop. Wait, 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 wait. Text and be late to work. Sorry, I'm late. Text and work. Text and pretend to work. Text and act surprised when someone calls you out for not working. Who, me? Text and meet up with a friend you haven't seen in forever. Hi. Oh, hey. Text and complain that they're on their phone the whole time. Text and listen to them complain that you're on your phone the whole time. Ugh. Text and whatever. But when you get behind the wheel, give your phone to a passenger. Put it in the glove box. Just don't text and drive. Visit StopTextsStopRex.org. A public service announcement brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. 
sitting down today with our chief operations officer here at Arbitrage, Mr. Greg Wong. Greg, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Josh. How are you? I'm awesome, man. It's always cool to sit down with you guys and to talk more about Arbitrage and talk a little bit about you. So who are you? Uh, well, I'm Greg Wong. I have been uh, with Arbitrage for, uh, what, about two years now. Um, and I've known the owner and founder for probably closer to eight. So I'm the chief operations officer right now. That doesn't entail a lot. We're getting off the ground. Um, I do a lot of teaching, though. You can catch me weekdays at 7 a.m. I do a Zoom every morning. Uh, we go over band basics and I hunt setups live. Um, so feel free to join. Um, if you're not in our Facebook group, please do join, and you'll have all the links to a lot of great instructors and training material. Absolutely. You can also go to arbitragetrade.org. Uh, to see a lot of our seminars and stuff. Absolutely. So, Greg, your job here at Arbitrage right now, it's its mainly a uh, an instructor role, but uh, what else do you do here? Um, well, <laughs> I, I, I lead Royce down rabbit holes all the time right now. I think we um, all do a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, be trading and I'll look at something. I'm like, oh, you know what? Maybe we could do this a better way. Or, you know, how, how would I want this information or what tool would better serve me to make better trades? And so more, more often than not, I'll, I'll tell Royce and he'll, he'll disappear for a bit and he'll kind of come back and say something and he'll disappear for a bit. And I'm like, you're mathing, aren't you? And he's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So tell me about your background. Um, I am primarily, I have an IT background. I did a lot of process improvement. I'm actually a green belt certified six Sigma pro for process improvement. Um, I spent my first 20 years of my, we'll call it my adult career with a company called international paper based in Memphis. And I left International Paper and took another job. And it was kind of in conjunction to work with Arbitrage as well. So it was to free up my time to work with Arbitrage as we started up. Yeah, um, I don't know if, if this is a secret to anybody or not, but uh, Greg is one of our remote uh, employees, I suppose. Uh, you're in Texas right now. Yes, so, I am. Very, very cool thing. Uh, um we have a lot of people who are uh, from a lot of disparate backgrounds and enjoy a lot of different things. Uh, tell me something you're passionate about, man. Um, I, I love technology. Uh, technology has always interested me. I can remember even as a kid when my dad brought the first computer home, I just was absolutely enthralled with kind of getting the inner workings. And ever since then, you know, when I started getting grown up money, I became a gadget freak and whatever the newest and most fun technology was, I wanted to get my hands on and play with. And, and then it kind of evolved into a career, you know, I, then I started saying, Oh, you know what, I can, I can do some automation here for the house. And Oh, wait a minute, I could do this at work too. So then I started coding. So began a career. We love our computers and gadgets around here, don't we? Absolutely. Oh yeah. Absolutely. So, Greg, just a little bit more about you. What's your favorite thing to do to relax? Well, I have a weird brain. My brain never shuts off. It's always going. But the only thing I can do that actually relaxes me is in the evenings, go into the bedroom, lay in bed. My wife lays her head on my chest and will watch movies or a television show and just scratch her back. And that's about the only time I actually relax in life. <laughs> That sounds really awesome. I know mm. that uh, one of our internal uh, discussions just now, we were talking about some of the latest movies. And I know we have a lot of movie geeks and a lot of, a lot of sci-fi geeks around here. What else is something that you would want us to know about you that we haven't talked about? Let's see. Technology freak, movie freak. As far as my background goes, I'm really kind of a self-starter. I believe in self-accountability. I believe in hard work. And I believe that you get out of what you put into things. So uh, I usually end up being a workaholic and I'm pretty passionate about the things I do work on. And we're absolutely happy to have you here, Greg. We'll have more for you on Arbitrage Weekend coming up. But for right now, have a great weekend. Greg, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Josh. I appreciate your time. You guys have an awesome weekend. We'll see you next time. Bye. 
Arbitrage Trade Analytics, LLC, is a privately held market research company. Arbitrage Trade Analytics, LLC, is solely responsible for the preparation and distribution of the content of this podcast. The opinions offered in this podcast are for informational purposes only and are not intended to be investment advice. Seek a duly licensed professional for investment advice. For more information about the informational research and services offered by Arbitrage Trade Analytics, LLC, please visit Arbitrage 